This is a recording of A Lesson Before Dying by Ernest J. Gaines, Chapter 17. Between Monday, when I talked to Miss Emma, and Friday, when I visited Jefferson again, something had happened inside me, and I wasn't so angry any more. Maybe it was the Christmas season and the children rehearsing their parts for the play, or maybe it was just me. I could never stay angry long over anything, but I could never believe in anything either for very long. At the jail, I had to go through the usual search. Then while the young deputy and I walked down the corridor to the cell block, I thought I would feel him out. Of the three of them at the jail, I figured he was the most likely to be honest with me. He was nearer my age, and he seemed better educated than the chief deputy or the sheriff. And I had heard from people in the quarter who knew his people that he had come from pretty good stock. How's he doing? I asked. He's doing all right, the deputy said. Does he ever eat the food we bring him? Some of it, the deputy said. He leaves a lot of it, and we give it to the other prisoners. Like she said, we've all eaten some of it. Good food, too. How do the other prisoners treat him? I asked. They're just curious, that's all, but they don't bother him. Do they ever talk to you about it? The execution? Yes. Sometimes they ask me things. I tell them I don't know a thing about it. I've never seen an execution. Does he ever bring it up? No, I'm sure he doesn't want to even think about it. He must think about it, I said. He must, because I know I do. I've seen myself walking to that chair more than once. I've woken up at night sweating. How do you take it? That's the question. I suppose every man wonders about death sometimes in his life. We came up to the landing just before the big door to the cell block. The deputy stood and looked at me. Listen, he said. We might as well call each other by our names. You're a Grant, aren't you? Grant Wiggins, I said. Paul Bonin, he said. We shook hands. Listen, he said. I'm not going to get too close to him, okay? Sure. I've been warned you don't get too close to somebody going to be executed. Be decent, treat him right, but that's all. This can get messy before it's over, and I will do my duty. I feel the same way. I said. We looked at each other a moment, then we continued to the cell block. What's a day like? I asked Paul. He eats one hot meal a day and a sandwich. Lots of beans, cabbage, potatoes, rice, you know. Sometimes the sandwich is the first meal. Ten in the morning, four in the evening. He can come out once a week and spend an hour in the day room. Walk, sit-ups, run, anything he wants. Most times... He walks or just sits there at the table. Once a week, he gets a shower. We have another prisoner give him a haircut. He's had one since he's been here. The barber can shave him, but you can see his face doesn't need shaving. That's about it. He talked to all the other prisoners? I asked. I never hear him. The deputy opened the heavy steel door to the cell block. Well, 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 if it ain't Mr. Rockefeller, one of the prisoners said. He wore the green coveralls given to all the prisoners who did not have their own clothes. He also wore a red-knit cap, his own. Mr. Rockefeller always leave you chicken and biscuits, he went on, but no bread for the cigarettes. Just cool it, Henry Martin, the deputy said. You won't get chicken or biscuits either. You keep that up. I hope you brought some plarines, another prisoner said. Anything, another one said, is jailhouse food enough to kill a man. Then don't eat it, Paul said to him. What, and starve to death? Uh-huh, the prisoner laughed. We came down to the last cell, Jefferson's cell, and Paul let me inside. See you in a while, he said, and he locked the door. Jefferson sat on the bunk, slumped forward a little, his big hands clasped together down between his legs. He was looking through the barred window toward the sycamore tree where several blackbirds were perched on a limb. How's it going? I said to him. He nodded his head, but he didn't turn to look at me. I brought you some food. I ain't hungry. 
Well, you might get hungry later, I said, and set the large paper bag of food on the end of the bunk. I was speaking to Paul, the deputy. He told me you always share with the other prisoners. If they want it, they can have it. He looked at his back. Then I went by him and stood under the window facing him. He was still gazing upward, and I noticed his eyes large and inflamed. Since my last visit, he had gotten a very close haircut, which exposed the structure of his almost triangular head. Jefferson, we have to talk, I said. He continued looking above my head toward the barred window. When your Nan Nan came back from seeing you the other day, she broke down crying. Everybody crying, he said. I cry. Is that what you want? Her to come home crying every time she sees you? He didn't answer. You can keep her from crying, I said. You can make it easier for her. You can do her that favor. He continued to look above my head toward the barred window. She wants somebody to do something for her before she dies. That's for I die, he said, lowering his eyes to look at me. He repeated it. That's for I die. Is it asking too much, Jefferson, to show some concern for her? Because I'm going to die anyhow? That's what you're trying to say? Now it was I who didn't answer. That's what you're trying to say, Mr. Teacher? He asked. We're all going to die, Jefferson. Tomorrow, Mr. Teacher? That's when you going to die? Next week? I don't know when I'm going to die, Jefferson. Maybe tomorrow? Maybe next week? Maybe today? That's why I try to live as well as I can every day and not hurt people, especially people who love me, people who have done so much for me, people who have sacrificed for me. I don't want to hurt those people. I want to help those people as much as I can. You can talk like that. You know you're going to walk out here in an hour. I bet you wouldn't be talking like that if you knowed you was going to stay in here. In here or out of here, Jefferson, what does it benefit you to hurt someone who loves you and who has done so much for you? I never asked to be born. Neither did I, I said. But here I am, and I'm trying to make the best of it. Like coming here vexing me, he asked. Am I vexing you, Jefferson? He grunted. Just keep on vexing me, he said. I bet you I say something about that old yellow woman you go with. You're speaking of Vivian? Just keep on vexing me, he said. If you're talking about Vivian, it's Vivian who keeps me coming here. Keep on vexing me, he said. See what I won't say. Just keep on vexing me. Go on and say anything you want, Jefferson. Keep on vexing me. Bet you'll, bet you I'll scream, he said. So Gidry would come up here and tell me to get out? Is that it? Is that it, Jefferson? I had been trying my best not to become angry again, but nothing I said made a difference. He just sat there grinning at me. Go on and scream, Jefferson. Go on and scream for Gidry if that's what you want. We looked at each other, and I could see in those big, reddened eyes that he was not going to scream. He was full of anger, and who could blame him? But he was no fool. He needed me, and he wanted me here, if only to insult me. Her old blank ain't no good, he said. My heart suddenly started pumping too fast. I made a fist of my right hand. If he had been standing, I would have hit him. If he had been any place else, I would have made him get up and I would have hit him. I would have hit any other man for saying that. But I recognized his grin for what it was, the expression of the most heart-rending pain I had ever seen on anyone's face. I rubbed my fist with my left hand, and I gradually, I began to relax. That lady you spoke of, boy, cares a lot about you, I said to him. She's waiting at that school right now for me to bring her news about you. That's a lady you spoke of, boy. That's a lady. Because it's she who keeps me coming here. Not your Nan Nan, not my aunt, Vivian. If I didn't have Vivian, I wouldn't be in this darn hole because I know darn well I'm not doing any good for you or for any of the others. Do you hear what I'm saying to you? 
Do you? I saw that grin slowly fade as he lowered his eyes toward the floor. When he looked up again, I saw tears in those big reddened eyes. Manners is for the living, he said. He looked at me a while. Then he swung around and knocked the bag of food off the bunk. The bag burst open on the floor, and there was fried chicken and biscuits and baked sweet potatoes all over the place. Food for the living, though, he said. When the deputy came back to let me out, I had picked up all the food and put it back into the torn paper bag, and I had placed the bag on the small steel shelf by the wash bowl. Jefferson and I had not exchanged a word for 15 minutes. He had lain down on the bunk facing the wall. I heard Paul coming down the block, speaking to the prisoners, calling them by their first names, threatening this one with hard work, praising another one for being good. He looked at Jefferson as he let me out of the cell. Jefferson lay with his back toward us. How did it go? He asked. Okay. We went down the cell block and the prisoners asked me what I had brought Jefferson to eat. I didn't answer. Just before we reached the heavy metal door, Henry Martin yelled out to me. Goodbye, Mr. Rockefeller. I'll be here when you come back. That's for sure, Paul said to him. He opened the steel door and we went out. Sheriff wants to see you in his office, Paul said. Is something the matter? The deputy shrugged his shoulders. He just told me that he wanted to see you before you left. The sheriff was talking on the telephone when Paul and I came into his office. The chief deputy was talking to the fat man whom I'd seen at Bicho's house. The sheriff sat back in his chair, his cowboy boots propped on his desk. He was talking to someone at the state prison in Angola. The chief deputy and the fat man were talking about fishing at Old River. They continued their conversation for another five or ten minutes, as if I weren't there. Paul stood beside me a while. Then he went into another office. I stood waiting. The sheriff hung up the telephone and looked at me over the tip of his boots. Well, Professor, make any headway, he asked. I don't know, I said. You've been seeing him a month. You still don't know if you're making any headway? No, sir. The chief deputy and the fat man had quit talking, and they were looking at me, too. You wouldn't be trying to hide something now, would you? The sheriff asked me. No, sir. Glad to hear that, he said. Hear that, Frank? He ain't hiding nothing. The fat man grunted and looked at me. Gidry drew his boots from the top of the desk and dropped his feet heavily to the floor. Women, he said, always coming up with something new. Now they want all y'all to meet in the bullpen, picnic-like. He looked at me as though I was supposed to know what he was talking about. Well, what do you think, he asked me when I didn't offer an answer. That's up to you, Sheriff, I said. Yes, I know that, he said, but the things they come up with. They want to meet him in the day room or another comfortable room. Comfortable room where they can all sit down because they can't all sit down in that cell. You ever heard of anything like that before? I don't know what you're talking about, Sheriff, I said. Don't you, Professor? No, sir, I don't. He regarded me a while, and so did the chief deputy and the fat man. The deputy was looking very mean. You don't know they come up to my wife? The sheriff asked me. I don't know a thing that you're talking about, sheriff. They come up to the house and said they couldn't sit down, and could she please, ma'am, speak to me about arranging a place so they can sit down? And you don't know anything about that? No, sir, I don't. You playing with me, professor? The sheriff asked. Sheriff, I just don't know what you're talking about. I would learn later. Miss Emma, my aunt, and Reverend Ambrose had visited the sheriff's wife a day after they had last seen Jefferson. The sheriff's wife greeted them graciously and set a precedent by having them sit in the living room while her maid served them coffee. They talked about little things before they came to their purpose in coming there. The sheriff's wife was stunned. She nearly spilled her coffee. What was wrong with the cell? Wasn't it big enough? Yes, but they couldn't all sit down. Was it necessary that they all sit down at the same time? 
Could they, couldn't they take turns? She was sure that Reverend Ambrose didn't mind standing, and maybe Jefferson could stand up too and let Taunt Lou and Miss Emma sit down. It was then that Miss Emma reminded the sheriff's wife of all the things she had done for the family over the years. The sheriff's wife was suddenly taken with a splitting headache. She wondered where the maid had gone to, but she didn't call for her. She frowned and rubbed her temples. She told Miss Emma that she could see what she would could do. But don't count on it, she said. The sheriff makes up his own mind in these matters. Just speak to him if you don't mind, Miss Emma said. I done done a lot for you and your family over all these years. Oh, Lord, do I know, the sheriff's wife said. Do I know, do I know, do I know. I'll speak to the sheriff. Lord, I'll be glad when all this is over. Miss Emma dropped her coffee cup on the floor and started calling on God. I didn't mean it that way, the sheriff's wife said. God in heaven knows I didn't mean it that way. Lou, Reverend Ambrose, can't y'all do something? The Lord knows I didn't mean it that way. Women, the sheriff said to me, always coming up with something new. He looked at his deputy. Well, Clark, what do you think? Clark's gray eyes looked like marbles in his big face. Let him stay where he's at. My sentiments exactly, the sheriff said. But if we put him in handcuffs and leg chains? I wouldn't even bother, Clark said. I wouldn't either, the sheriff said. But you got these women. He ain't here for no picnic, Clark said. He killed Mr. Grope. Let him stay right there in that last cell till that last day. What you say, Frank? The sheriff asked the fat man. The fat man shrugged his shoulders. I'm just standing here. I'll go to him and leave it up to him, the sheriff said to me. If he wants to come in the day room in shackles, all right. If he wants to stay in his cell unshackled, all right. But cell or day room, if I notice any aggravation, I stop all visits. You see, I know you haven't done a thing yet. Boys on the block tell me you haven't done a thing, and I doubt if you ever will. I didn't answer him, but I was thinking, sure, if you don't know how right you are. You can take her this message, the sheriff said. He can meet her in the day room if he wants, but he will be shackled. Every moment of the rest of his life, he's going to know he's in jail, and he's going to be here till the end. This ain't no school, and it ain't no picnic ground, all right? Yes, sir. Good. I'll see you later, Professor. Chapter 18 As he had promised, the sheriff went to Jefferson and asked him if he would like to meet his visitors in the day room instead of his cell. The sheriff explained that he would be shackled hand and feet there. He also told Jefferson that it was entirely up to him and that his wishes would be carried out. If that's what they want, Jefferson said. No, not what they want, what you want. If that's what they want, Jefferson repeated. Is it yes then? If that's what they want, Jefferson said, I'm going to die anyhow. When Miss Emma and my aunt and Reverend Ambrose went to the courthouse, they were led to the day room by the young deputy, Paul. The large room contained three tables made of steel, with benches attached on either side also of steel. There were no other visitors in the day room, and Miss Emma selected the center table. Paul told them he would be back in a few minutes. While he was gone, Miss Emma took out the food and placed it on the table. She set places for four, two on either side of the table. My aunt and Reverend Ambrose stood back watching her. My aunt would later say that Miss Emma went about setting the table the same way she would have done at home, humming her termination song to herself. This going to be his place and this going to be my place, she said. My aunt said that Miss Emma, still humming to herself, passed her hand over the table to make sure there was no dust, no specks there, as she would do at home. That's your place there, Lou, and that's yours right there, Reverend Ambrose, she said. Don't it look nice? Ain't this much better? 
My aunt and Reverend Ambrose agreed that it looked nice and it was much better than the cell. Then they heard the chains. At a moment later, the door at the far end of the room opened and Jefferson came in, followed by the deputy. Jefferson had not been chained before, and he took long steps that caused him to trip, my aunt said. He came to the table like somebody half blind, and he didn't sit down until Paul told him to do so. Paul told him that he had to stay in that one place until he was returned to his cell. He ain't going to move, Miss Emma said. I'm going to see that. I thank you kindly. You understand, don't you, Jefferson? Paul said. I hear you, Jefferson said. He going to mind, Miss Emma said. I'm going to see to that. Y'all have a good dinner, Paul said, and left. He come from good stock, Miss Emma said. Y'all sit down. Well, Jefferson, how you feeling? He did not answer her. He sat with bowed head, his cuffed hands down between his knees under the table. My aunt and Reverend Ambrose sat down. Miss Emma dished up the food. Mustard greens with pieces of pork fat mixed in it. There was stewed beef meat, rice, and biscuits. A little cake for dessert, my aunt said. You gonna eat for me, Jefferson? Miss Emma asked him. He kept his head bowed, his shackled hands under the table, and he did not answer her. You'll eat if I feed you? She asked. When he did not answer her, she dished up a small piece of meat and some mustard greens on the spoon and held it up to his mouth. He would not open his mouth. Miss Emma looked at my aunt, and my aunt, who had been trying to eat, could see all the hurt in her face. When I came up there a couple of days later, the chief deputy told me I could meet Jefferson in his cell or in the day room. I told him it didn't matter to me where we met. The chief deputy told me it didn't matter to him either, but he told Paul to take me to the day room. I sat at the center table, just as Miss Emma and my aunt and Reverend Ambrose had two days before, and I heard the chains out along the cell block before I saw anyone. When they came in, Jefferson in front, shackled, walking with short steps, his head bowed and his shoulders stooped. They came up to the table and Paul told him to sit down. He sat without looking at me, his shoulders hanging low and closer together than they should be. I'll be back, Paul said. Can we walk? I asked him. He had his exercise, Paul said. I'll have to ask Clark. No, that's all right, I said. Maybe next time. Paul left. How's it going? I said. All right, Jefferson said without raising his head. You want to eat something? I ain't hungry, he said. Yes, you are. I said, I know I am. There was store-bought bread, fried pork chops, and baked sweet potatoes. I put some of it in front of him and some in front of me. I started eating. Come on, eat something, I said. He raised his head slowly and studied me a while. He had lost some weight. What had been a round, smooth face when he first came here was beginning to show some bone structure. His eyes were still bloodshot. I had seen them many times in my sleep the past month. What do you want? he asked me. I was eating. I shrugged my shoulders. Just want you to eat something, that's all. What do you want? he asked me again. His expression hadn't changed and there was no change of inflection in his voice. His reddened eyes accused me of wanting something without saying it. Us to talk, I said. About what? I don't know, I said. Anything you want to talk about. What do you want to talk about? That chair, he said. He watched me now because he knew he had caught me off guard. I looked at him a moment, then I started eating again. That chair was the last thing that I wanted to talk about. We're starting our Christmas program, I said, but I could see that he was thinking about other things. You remember those Christmas programs when you were in school? It's Christmas, he asked, but he was not thinking about Christmas. He was thinking about something else, and he knew that I knew he was thinking about something else. No, Christmas is still a few weeks off, I said, but we're getting ready. That's when he was born. Or that's when he died, he asked. Who, I said. 
He looked at me, knowing that I knew who he was talking about. Born, I said. That's right, he said. Easter, when they nailed him to the cross. And he never said a mumbling word. I had not finished eating, but I knew I couldn't eat any more. I put the rest of the pork chalk, chop and the slice of light bread on the napkin before me. Jefferson, do you know what moral means? I asked him. He looked at me, knowing that I knew what he was thinking about. Obligation, I said. Do you know what obligation means? He didn't answer, but he kept looking at me. No matter how bad off we are, I said, we still owe something. You owe something, Jefferson, not to me, surely not to that sheriff out there, but to your godmother. You must show her some understanding, some kind of love. That's for humans, he said. I ain't no human. Then why do you speak, Jefferson, I said. Human beings are the only creatures on earth who can talk. Why do you talk and wear clothes? Why do you wear clothes? You trying to get me wool gathered, he said. I'm not trying to confuse you, Jefferson. She loves you, and I want you to give her something, something that she can be proud of. Hogs don't give nothing. Hogs don't leave nothing, he said. Jefferson, do you like coming out here, or you prefer staying in the cell? Anything you all want, he said, don't matter to me. It matters to her, Jefferson. Out here, she can sit down, he grunted. I'm the one going to have to sit down. You can be kinder to her, Jefferson. Every time she comes up here, she comes back to the quarter looking worse and worse. She ought to stay home, he said. All she'd do is worry more if she didn't see you. Hogs don't worry. Hogs just know, he said. Hogs don't know anything, Jefferson, I said. Only human beings know. Only human beings worry. This hog know, fattening up for Christmas, kill him at Christmas time, he said. Nobody is going to die at Christmas, I said. How do you know? They told you? Nobody told me anything, I said. I just know nothing is going to happen at Christmas. I'd be glad when it's over, he said. Old hog, get him some rest then. Do you want me to leave, Jefferson? Leave when you want. Old hog don't care. He lowered his head. The chains jangled under the table. I wanted to leave, but it was too early. The sheriff would have had his proof that I hadn't reached Jefferson, that I was giving up. They found a pine tree this year, I said, a nice little pine tree. His head was bowed. He didn't answer. His hair had begun to grow back, but you could still see the big bones of his skull. A half hour later, Paul came in to return him to his cell. Jefferson walked in short steps, his head bowed, his arms hanging low, his shoulders too close together. After locking him in, Paul came back to the day room, and he and I walked down to the main floor together. What do you think? he asked. I don't know, but that's what she wants. Paul nodded. He understood. He had come from good stock. I went back to town to the Rainbow and had a couple of beers. When I figured Vivian would be out of class, I drove over to the school. One of the teachers was directing the children onto the bus, and Vivian and another teacher stood by the flagpole talking. Vivian saw me and came over and got into the car. Hi, she said, and kissed me. A drink or a sandwich, I said. A drink's not too bad, she said. I pulled away from behind the bus where the teacher was still commanding the children, and we went back to the rainbow. The place was quiet and dark, and we sat at a table far over in the corner. The teachers who were already there knew that we wanted to be alone. The waitress hadn't come in yet, so Claiborne brought us our drinks. After he left, Vivian looked across the table at me. I don't think we ought to go to Baton Rouge tonight, I said. Vivian drank and set her glass back down and looked at me, waiting for me to go on. We had talked about going to Baton Rouge that night, but she knew I had seen him today, and we had been noticing that after my visits with him, things did not always go well for us in bed. How's the program going? I asked her. All right, she said. 
waiting. Mine's about the same, I said. The children found a nice little pine tree this year. Before it was oak or anything else they could find. But this year, a little pine tree. Not very tall, but nice. Nice and round. Vivian nodded. She was looking at me closely. I love you more and more, I said. If you'd just say the word, God knows I'd drop everything and hate each other for the rest of our lives. Grant? No, she said. I could never hate you, ever. You could and you would, she said. No, I said. Yes, Grant, you would hate me for letting you make this decision, or I would hate you for doing it. I'm not doing any good up there, Vivian, I said. Nothing is changing. Something is, she said. Chapter 19 It was cold and it rained for the two weeks preceding our Christmas program. It rained too much for the people to go out into the field to cut cane, and the field and the roads were too muddy for the cane to be brought to the derrick for loading and then shipment to the mill for grinding. People stayed at home around the fireplace or near the stove in the kitchen. You could see gray-blue smoke rising from the big chimneys in the fronts of the houses and from the smaller chimneys in the back. And because the wind always came into the quarter from the river this time of year, you could see the smoke drifting from the quarter back across the field toward the cemetery and the swamp. The only time you were likely to see someone out in the yard was to cut more wood to throw onto the fireplace or put into the kitchen stove. The rest of the time, the quarter was deserted. The doors and windows shut tight against the cold wind and the rain. There was still a light drizzle on the night of the program, but it did not keep the people away. I had told the students that this program should be dedicated to Jefferson, and they had taken the message home, and many people who had never attended a Christmas or graduation program came to the church that night. The program began at 7 o'clock, but people were there much earlier. Because of the rain, they could not drive cars in the quarter, so they either walked or came by wagon. Reverend Ambrose, who lived up the river and not on the plantation, parked his car along the highway and walked to the church. As usual, he was dressed in a dark suit, white shirt, and dark tie, but tonight he also wore a yellow slicker. Most of the other people wore their going-to-town clothes, not their everyday working clothes, and not their Sunday best either. Going-to-town clothes were old clothes, but without any visible patches. The shirts and the dresses may have been faded, but they were clean and they were neat. No one lingered outside, as they would have had the weather been better. After scraping off their shoes on the bottom step, they kicked the mud on the ground and came inside the church. The women folk who had brought food set their pots or pans or bowls on the tables that we had placed against the blackboards in the back. Mrs. Sarah James, who had arrived at 6.30, sat guarding the food until after the program, when everyone would eat. The other women took vacant seats as close to the heater as they could get. The men and the older boys stood in the back, talking, until the women folk told them to sit down. I was behind the curtain with the students who had been chosen to participate in the Christmas play. The curtain was made up of four bedsheets, suspended from a wire that extended from one side of the church to the other. The three of the sheets were very white. The fourth was a light gray. This one belonged to Mrs. Rita Lawrence, and as long back as I could remember, she had insisted on contributing something to the Christmas program, and every time it was a sheet, probably the same one, and it was never as white as the others. The audience always knew which sheet was Miss Rita's, and they thought it was embarrassing to have it hanging up there with all the others. But no one had the courage to speak to Miss Rita about it, and each year it was one of the four that made up the curtain. Irene Cole and Odessa Freeman were assisting me in pre preparing the students behind the curtain. The two shepherds wore broken croaker sacks over their dress clothes, and each of them carried a tall bamboo cane curved at the top and tied with black thread. The three wise men wore crepe paper robes. 
The robes were red, green, and yellow. Irene and Odessa continued to remind the wise men to be careful not to tear their robes by moving around so much. Mary, the mother of Jesus, wore a wrinkled blue denim dress to show that she was a poor woman. Joseph, her husband, had on overalls and carried a hammer in the loop of his pants. Baby Jesus was a white alabaster doll dressed in a long white gown. The girls in the choir wore white dresses, the boys white shirts. Every so often I would part the curtain to see how many people had come in. Miss Rita Lawrence and her big grandson, Bach, were two of the first people there and sat up front, with Bach taking up almost a third of the bench. Twice, Bach had been sent to the mental institution at Jackson, but the doctors there knew he was not dangerous and felt they could do no more for him than Miss Rita probably could do for him at home. And after keeping him a week or two, they sent him back to her. Bach had one peculiarity other than being unable to look after himself, and that was his love for marbles. He carried them with him all the time. He sat there now playing with the marbles in the right pocket of his overalls. Miss Rita occasionally had to touch him on the hand to keep them quiet. On the bench with Bach and Miss Rita sat Julia Lovonia, who had two children in the program. The boy was one of the shepherds and the girl as Mary, mother of Jesus. James, her husband, was not there. A short, big-headed mulatta with curly black hair and gray eyes, he had told me once that he had better things to do than go to a blank gathering. But Julia was there, and I knew that she had brought pecan and coconut pralines, just as she did every year. The Freemans had come in, too. Joe Freeman sat far in the back, but his wife Harriet and her mother, Aunt Agnes, and several of the children were up front, directly behind Miss Rita, Bach, and Julia Lavonia. The Coles, Irene's people, sat behind them, Norman and his wife, Sarah. Sarah's mother, Leah Wells, Sarah's sister, Esther, and Esther's boyfriend, Henry, and two or three children. Sarah usually brought crackling and baked sweet potatoes to the Christmas program. On the other side of the aisle, in the front row, and still wearing their overcoats because they were far from the heater, sat my aunt and Miss Emma, Miss Eloise, Bowie, and Inez. Behind them were Farrell, Giroux and his little wife, Ophelia. Ophelia was a delicate mulatto woman whose sisters came to the plantation every Sunday morning to take her to the Catholic church in Bayonne. She would return late in the evening, and we would hardly see her again until the next Sunday, when she would climb into the back of the car to go to Mass. I supposed it was her husband, Farrell, who got her out tonight, because she had never come before. Behind them sat most of the Martin family, about ten of them. Most, but not all. The father, Herbert, was not there, and neither was the idiot boy, Jesse, or the pregnant daughter, Vera, or the old grandmother. But Viola, the mother, was there, along with eight or nine of her children. Two others were in the choir behind the curtain. The Williamses were there, four of them. Three Ruffins, mother, son, and daughter, were there. The Griffins, Harry and Lena, with their two grown-up unmarried daughters, Alberta and Luberta, were there. So the church was nearly full, and it was only a quarter to seven. The bad weather had not kept them away, but probably had brought them out tonight. Since they could not work in the field or in their gardens, they had no reason to stay at home, claiming to be tired. At seven o'clock, I parted the curtains and stepped out to face the audience. I told them how happy the children and I were to see them all here tonight, and that I knew they would enjoy the program because their children had worked so hard the past weeks to make it a success. I invited Reverend Ambrose, who sat in one of the side pews, to lead us in prayer. He stood and asked all to stand and bow their heads. The Lord's Prayer was first. Then he thanked God for letting us see a brand new day and for allowing us to gather together in his house 
in such inclement weather. The minister was a small man and seemed timid, but he did possess a strong, demanding voice when he prayed. He asked God to go with all the sick and afflicted, both at home and in the hospitals across the land. He asked God to visit the jail cells all over the land, and especially in Bayoni, and to go with the guilty and the innocent. He asked God to go with all those here tonight who did not know him in the pardon of their sins and thought they did not need him. No matter how educated a man was, he meant me, though he didn't call my name. He, too, was locked in a cold, dark cell of ignorance if he did not know God in the pardon of his sins. He closed by beseeching God to look down upon his humble little church and bless this gathering. The people responded with, Amen, and sat back down. My aunt said, Amen, louder than anyone, and she was looking directly at me. I went behind the curtain and, taking one of the middle sheets while a student did the same on the other side, pulled the curtain back to reveal the stage. The choir of a dozen boys and girls moved down below the altar to sing Silent Night. Irene Cole directed them. I stood behind the gathered curtain on the right so I could watch both the choir and the audience. The children had worked hard and they sang beautifully. And this, too, was due to the bad weather. At any other time, they would have had to go home to work in the field or around the house. But since the weather had been so inclement, to use one of Reverend Ambrose's wards, they had had more time for practice. The audience appreciated the singing. Even those who did not respond with amen, amen, gave the choir their closest attention. So did Bach. Once he raised his hand to point, a sign to show how affected he was by the singing. But Miss Rita took the hand gently and brought it to his knee. She kept her hand on his, not pressing it, but comforting him. After Silent Night, the choir sang, O Little Town of Bethlehem, and my eyes left the audience, and I looked at the little pine tree stuck in the tub of dirt, decorated with strips of red and green crepe paper, and bits of lint cotton and streamers of tinsel, and a little white cardboard star on its highest branch. And under the tree and propped against the tub was one lone gift, wrapped in red paper and tied with a green ribbon and with a red and green bow. The children had contributed nickels, dimes, quarters, money they had made from picking pecans. And Irene, Odessa, and Odile James had gone to Baton Rouge and bought a wool sweater and a pair of wool socks. The people sitting up front could see the package, and they knew who it was for, and at times I could see their eyes shifting from the choir toward the tree, and I could see the change in their expressions. But Jingle Bells, a gayer and livelier song than the previous two, brought everyone's attention back to the choir and I can catch in people's faces relief from their thoughts. Odessa Freeman's Twas the Night Before Christmas followed, and it was more than a simple recitation. It was a dramatic performance. In her long white dress with long sleeves and with her black hair, recently straightened and shining, combed back and tied with a white silk ribbon, and her body swaying and her arms spread out one moment, then closed so that the palms of her hands came together and her voice rising to fill the church, then falling to a whisper that you could barely hear. Odessa not only made you see the room where the stockings were hung, but enabled you to hear the reindeer on the roof and hear Santa before you saw him come down the chimney to fill the stockings. You heard him call the name of each reindeer after ascending the chimney, and you actually watched the reindeer going to the next house in the quarter. It was so real that Bach felt it too and pointed again, and Miss Rita nodded that she understood his feeling, and she drew back the hand and placed it on his knee and kept her own hand on his to comfort him. Following the poem came an essay, The Little Pine Tree. Written and read by Albert H. Martin III. 
He told of all the other Christmas trees over the years, of oak, of cypress, of strange bushes that could not be named. He told of how the trees had been cut in the pasture and dragged back to the quarter, and how the girls had washed the leaves to make the tree presentable. Then he came to the little pine tree, not a great tree. It was not tall, not blessed with great limbs, but it was pine, and it was the most beautiful of all the Christmas trees. The little pine tree even took on a character of its own. It was so happy to be here. While he spoke, Albert Martin III gestured toward the tree, and everybody looked at the tree and at the single gift underneath it. Hark the herald angels sing, came next, and led into the nativity scene. As the song ended, two shepherds in their croker sack robes came on stage behind the choir. The shepherds were attending their flock when suddenly a light appeared on the back wall under the pictures of Christ and Reverend Ambrose. The light came from a flashlight held by a student from stage right. Shepherd 1, pointing. A star in the east. Shepherd 2, and so bright. Shepherd 1, what does it mean? Shepherd 2, wished I knowed. Shepherd 1 looked at Shepherd 2 as if he were about to correct his grammar, but changed his mind. No one in the audience seemed to have noticed. Three wise men enter from stage right, dressed in red, green, and yellow robes of cray paper. Several people in the audience snickered and made comments. Shepherd 1. Wise men, they can tell us. Shepherd 2. Tell us, O oh wise man, what yon star mean? Wise man one. It shines down on Bethlehem. Wise man two. Little town of Bethlehem. Wise man three. We must go to Bethlehem. They all look at the star. The star moved a little, as if the person holding the flashlight was getting tired. Shepherd one. But what it mean? Wise men one, in time you'll know. Shepherd two, how we gonna know? Wise men one, he'll let us know. Shepherd one, God on high? Wise men one, works in mysterious way. The light moved again as if the person was changing hands or giving the flashlight to someone else to hold. Wise men two, wonders to perform. Shepherd two, but we ain't nothing but poor little shepherds. Wise men one, the lowest is highest in his eyes. Wise men two, let us be off. Wise men three, to yawn Bethlehem. The wise men leave stage right. Shepherd one, brightest star I ever seen. Shepherd two, got to mean something. The star dipped down and came back up. Shepherd one looked at the person holding the light and looked back at me to be sure I had seen it too. Shepherd one, let us kneel down. Nothing will bother the flock tonight. The shepherds kneel as the curtain closes. The curtain opens immediately afterward. We see Mary sitting on a bench holding baby Jesus. Joseph stands beside her, looking down upon the baby. A hammer hangs from Joseph's overall loop. Off stage right, people are heard approaching. First speaker. The star points yawn. Second speaker. We close now. Third speaker. Yawn, yawn the stable. The three wise men enter from stage right and immediately kneel down before Mary and baby Jesus. Wise man one. Surely he come. Wise man two, nodding, him, all right. Wise man three, our savior, all three. We bring thee gifts, O Lord. Each places a penny on the bench beside Mary. Mary, surprised, my little baby, savior? Wise man one, nodding, your little baby. Mary, happy. My little baby. She holds him up to Joseph. Look, Joseph, my little baby, Savior. 
Joseph nods but does not speak. Mary, rocking baby Jesus in her arms, begins to sing, Joy to the world, the Lord is come. The wise men stand and join her, and so does Joseph and the shepherds in the choir, and all the others, including the boy who held the flashlight. As the song ends, they all bow to the audience. While the children remained on stage, I asked Reverend Ambrose if he had any last remarks. Again, he thanked God for allowing so many people to come out tonight. Again, he reminded us that we were not all saved from sin. Even with book learning, we are still fools if we did not have God in our hearts. Again, he asked God to go with those locked up in prison cells. He thanked God for all his blessings, and the congregation responded with, Amen, Amen, Amen. I thanked the minister and told the congregation that that was our program for this year, and I reminded them that there were refreshments in the back. The children waited on stage to hear what I thought of the program. I told them that it was fine, just fine. The children left the stage to get in line for food. Do you want me to bring you something, Mr. Wiggins? Irene asked me. No, thanks, I said. Something the matter, Mr. Wiggins? No, why? I said. You don't look too happy. I'm okay, I said. Go on and get something to eat. Irene left to get in line, but she looked back at me over her shoulder. She was right. I was not happy. I had heard the same carols all my life, seen the same little play, with the same mistakes in grammar. The minister had offered the same prayer as always, Christmas or Sunday. The same people wore the same old clothes and sat in the same old places. Next year it would be the same, and the year after that, the same again. Vivian said things were changing, but where were they changing? I looked back at the people around the table, talking, eating, drinking their coffee and lemonade, but I was not with them. I stood alone. I saw one of the li little Hebert girls coming up the aisle toward me, balancing a napkin of food on both her hands. She had to pass by the tree before reaching the pulpit. She watched the food all the time to be sure she did not drop anything. Miss Lou, say you bring this? Thanks, Gloria. I sat on a chair inside the pulpit, eating fried chicken and bread. The people were still laughing and talking. Just outside the pulpit was the little pine Christmas tree with its green and red strips of cray paper for lights, its bits of lint cotton for snow, and the narrow strings of tinsel for icicles. And there was the lone gift against the tub of dirt. Chapter 20 It was late February, and we were just over a month into the spring semester. I sat at the table going over fourth grade arithmetic papers while the children were out at recess. The older children could be heard playing ragball behind the church. In front, a group of smaller boys were shooting marbles, and several girls were jumping rope beside the church. I could hear the rope hitting the ground and the rhythmic hand clapping and singing. The marble game was barely audible, but the ragball players behind the church were loud and clear, and it took all my concentration to go on with my work. The children had been outside about ten minutes, when I felt that one of them had come back inside and was standing down the aisle in front of me. I finished correcting the paper before looking up. Farrell Giroux stood in front of the table with his hat in his hand. Mr. Farrell? I said, standing quickly. He looked very small and very sad. He had come to tell me something, but he didn't know how to say it. Didn't mean to barge in, he said. I was just sitting here, I said, trying to put him at ease. He looked at me and batted his eyes a few times. Is something the matter, Mr. Farrell? They want you up there, he said. He wanted me to read more into what he had said than he had told me. At the front? I asked him. He nodded. He wanted me to read more into his nod. I waited for him to go on. That boy, he fidgeted with his hat. He didn't want to say any more. I waited. They done set the date, he said, but not wanting to say it. They want you and Moses up there. They want y'all to tell her. 
When? Right now, I reckon. I still have another hour of class. I just take the message, Professor. He lowered his eyes and fidgeted with his hat again. Thank you, Mr. Farrell. He nodded and started up the aisle, stoop-shouldered and very small. I saw him put on his hat as he went down the steps into the yard. When he came out into the road, he looked up the quarter toward the big house, but instead of going back to work, he turned left and went home. I had followed him to the door, and now I went outside to tell the children that recess was over. They formed a double line, boys in one line and girls in the other, according to grades and sizes. They had come in and sat down. I gave them assignments and told them I had to go up to the big house and that I was leaving Irene in charge. If anybody caused any trouble, I would deal with that tomorrow. I asked Irene to walk with me to the door, and I told her to dismiss the children at 3 o'clock. I didn't tell her why I had to go to the house. The sky was overcast, and there was a chill in the air. Grinding was over, and the people had begun to chop up the ground for new planting. Flocks of blackbirds followed the tractors, searching in the fresh, uncovered earth for insects and worms. The plum tree in the Cole's front yard and the cherry tree in the Freeman's side yard were covered with blossoms, white and lavender. The pecan trees were bare, grayless, and leafless, but the live oaks and magnolias were full of leaves. The road was fairly dry, but the ditches on either side still held water from the heavy rain we had had during the past couple of months. When I came up to Henri Pichot's house, I saw Reverend Ambrose's black Ford parked under the tree in the backyard. Inez opened the kitchen door when I knocked. The preacher sat at the table drinking coffee. Inez asked me if I wanted a cup of coffee, but I said no. She left the kitchen. Reverend Ambrose asked me about my aunt. He had seen her at church only a few days before, but he didn't know what else to talk to me about. I told him she was all right. He wanted to know about school, and I said that everything was going pretty well there. We were quiet then, because he could not think of anything else to say to me, and I had nothing to say to him. Inez came back into the kitchen and told us that Henri Pichot had called the sheriff and that the sheriff would be here in 15 to 20 minutes. I hope this is not one of those days, I said. I thought he was already here. You sure I can't get you a cup of coffee? Inez offered again. No, thanks, I said. I have a lot of work to do at school. I hope I don't have to hang around here all day. I'm sure he's on his way, Inez said. Reverend Ambrose, who sat very close to the table, raised his coffee to his mouth, then returned it to the saucer quickly. As promised, the sheriff was knocking on the front door about 15 minutes later. His knock was not a request for entry. It was an announcement that he was already coming in. Inez sighed deeply, thanking God, and went to the front of the house. I heard the sheriff asking her if we were there, and a moment later she came back into the kitchen. They want you all in the front, she said. This was the first time I had been in any part of Pichot's house other than the kitchen, and I was sure that it was the first time for the minister as well. I waited for him to move first, but he was waiting on me. I made a respectful gesture for him to precede me, but he would not move, was afraid to move, until Inez took the lead. Henry Pichot and the sheriff stood by the fireplace talking. Pichot wore a brown and tan plaid jacket, a tan vest, and open-collared shirt and dark trousers. Sheriff Guidry wore a gray suit, a string tie, and black cowboy boots. He held his cowboy hat against his leg. He and Pichot looked at us as we came into the room. I had never seen Pichot look so weird. Have a seat, he said. The sheriff has something to say. All the furniture in the room was old. Faded, overstuffed chairs, an overstuffed love seat, an overstuffed couch, and a rattan rocker with a pillow. The lamp tables were old, and the lamps and lamp shades looked just as old. Reverend Ambrose and I sat on the edge of the couch. 
the sheriff sat in one of the chairs and held on to his hat. So I figured that what he had to say was not going to take very long. Henry Pichot stood at the fireplace, his back against the mantel. Behind him, a couple of smoldering logs sent a thin stream of gray smoke and an occasional spark up the chimney. The warrant came down from the governor today, Gidry spoke hesitantly. It happens second Friday after Easter. Inez came into the room with two cups of coffee on a silver tray. Pichot added sugar and milk to one cup and removed it from the tray. The sheriff rested his hat on one knee as he took the other cup from the tray. He added sugar, stirring slowly. I want things to go on as they have. Don't cause trouble for him, the sheriff looked at me. When I left him, he was calm. He seemed to understand. I want to keep it that way. Any questions? Reverend Ambrose and I exchanged glances, but neither of us had a question now. What about her? Gidry asked. The wife said she might need a doctor. That's mighty kindly, Reverend Ambrose said. My thanks to Miss Edna. I'll send Dr. Guillory when I get back to town, the sheriff said. Any other questions? I want us to have an understanding. Why that date, I asked. Gidry drank from his cup and looked over the rim at me. He did not like me. I was one of the smart ones. He and Pichot exchanged glances. I could tell that they had been talking about it before Reverend Ambrose and I came into the room. Pichot left the explanation up to the sheriff. Easter, he said. He did not want to go on, but he felt he should. After all, a man was going to be put to death. It had to be before or after Easter. It couldn't happen during Lent. I would learn later from the young deputy that the governor had originally signed an execution order to be carried out two weeks before Ash Wednesday. But one of his aides pointed out that another execution was scheduled during that time. And because of our state's heavily Catholic population, it might not go well to have two executions just before the beginning of Lent. Can we still visit him like we've been doing? I asked. Sure, the sheriff said. But just remember, keep it down. I don't want you aggravating him. He's got just over a month. April 8th. April 8th, I said to no one. April 8th. Friday, April 8th, between noon and three, the sheriff said. Between noon and three, I said to no one. Well, if there ain't no more questions, I have to get on back to town, Gidry said. He finished his coffee and set the cup and saucer on a lamp table. You won't forget the doctor, Sheriff, Reverend Ambrose asked. You think she'll need him? She ain't been too well lately, the Reverend said. I'll call him from here, Gidry said. Can he drive down the quarter? It's passable, Pichot said. I went down there yesterday. The Sheriff went to the telephone table and made his call to Bayoni. I could hear only part of what he was saying because I could not get that date and time out of my mind. How do people come up with a date and time to take life from another man? Who made them God? Audrey, let me speak to Sid, Gidry was saying over the telephone. Twelve white men say a black man must die, and another white man sets the date and time without consulting one black person. Justice? The old woman, the sheriff was saying to the doctor. I think she is the one who attended the trial, worked for the family. His nanan, Reverend Ambrose said weakly. The sheriff did not hear the minister. Yes, it's passable, Sid. You won't get your brown and white shoes dirty. They sentenced you to death because you were at the wrong place at the wrong time, with no proof that you had anything at all to do with the crime, other than being there when it happened. Yet, six months later, they come and unlock your cage and tell you, we, us, White folks all have decided it's time for you to die because this is the convenient date and time. Oh, she's all right. And how's Lucy? The sheriff asked the doctor about his wife. And on Friday, too. Always on Friday. Sometime as he died between 12 and 3. But they can't take this one's life too soon after the recognition of his death because it might upset the sensitive few. 
It can happen less than two weeks later, though, because even the sensitive few will have forgotten about their Savior's death by then. Give Lucy my love, Gidry said. I owe you one. The sheriff hung up the telephone and turned to us. He's on his way, and I have to head on back myself. No other questions? We had no more questions. Thank you all for coming, Pichot said. But he was not thanking us for gracing his home with our presence so much as he was telling us that it was time to leave. Reverend Ambrose and I got up from the couch and went back to the kitchen. Inez looked at us, crying. We must all show courage for Sister Emma's sake, Reverend Ambrose said to her. Inez raised the end of her apron and wiped her eyes. You drove? Reverend Ambrose asked me. I walked. Well, you can ride back down the quarter with me, he said. I'm not going back down there right now, I said. I'm not going back down there and tell her he's going to die April 8th. Not me. You'd have the strength if you had God, Reverend Ambrose said. That's where you come in, Reverend, I said. I'm going for a walk, a long walk in the opposite direction. Excuse me. I went across the backyard out to the road, and I turned left and walked over to the highway and down to the river. The river still ran high from all the rain we had had in the past couple of months, and from the water that drained into it from the bayous and fields. I walked in the ankle-high grass a safe distance from where the water flowed upon the bank until I found a good place to stop. I could see the houses and trees on the other bank, and the cars moving on the road behind them. I tried wiping that away. I wanted to see nothing but miles and miles of clear blue water, then an island where I could be alone. Or Vivian and me, just the two of us, and absolutely no one else. No one else. But the river remained the same high and muddy, and I started walking again. When I could go no further without getting my feet wet, I went up the bank and walked alongside the road. I must have gone three or four miles before turning back. I figured that by now the minister and my aunt had seen Miss Emma, and the doctor had probably visited her, and other women in the quarter had gone to look after her, too. It was near dark when I reached the quarter, and I went back to the church to get my satchel. Irene had collected all the papers and stacked them neatly on the table, and had left me a note saying that the children had been orderly. I stuffed the note and the papers inside my satchel and left the church. Chapter 21 Two cars were parked in front of Miss Emma's house, and as I got closer, I saw that one was Reverend Ambrose's. The porch light was on, and though I didn't feel like going into the house, I thought I owed Miss Emma that respect. The door was shut against the cold, but someone opened it immediately when I knocked. The room was crowded and warm from a nice fire in the fireplace. People spoke quietly, but still it was noisy. Inez was there, and I asked her about Miss Emma. She nodded toward the bed. Miss Emma lay under a quilt, her head resting on two pillows. The mosquito bar hung on the bed behind her. I asked her how she felt. She did not answer. Only a slight movement at the corners of her mouth showed that she had heard me. Her eyes were looking at something that was not in the room. I left the bed and went into the kitchen where most of the talking was going on. My aunt was in charge back there. As Miss Emma's best friend, she was taking over now that Miss Emma had taken to her bed. She was at the stove making coffee. You could smell that Luzanne coffee all over the kitchen. Reverend Ambrose was sitting at the table talking to a couple of people who did not live in the quarter. He gave me a long, hard look to let me know what he thought of me, but I already knew what he thought of me, and I turned away from him. Irene, who was helping my aunt in the kitchen, asked me if I wanted a cup of coffee. I told her no, and I thanked her for taking over the class for me that afternoon. She told me she liked the practice. I knew that she wanted to be a teacher. My aunt heard us talking and turned from the stove to look at me. I could see in her face that she and Reverend Ambrose had had a conversation about me, and he had probably said some things that I would not care to hear. She told me that my food was on the back of the stove at home, but I would have to warm it if I wanted to eat. She had nothing else to say to me and started talking to someone else. 
After I had been there ten minutes, I left the house. At home, I lit a fire to warm the food, cabbage with salt, pork, and Irish potatoes. I didn't have to warm up the cornbread. I made a fire in my aunt's room so it would be warm when she came home, and I went around to my side of the house and lit a fire there, too. By now, the food was warm, and I went back into the kitchen to eat, sitting near the stove with the plate balanced on my left hand. I had just finished eating and was washing the plate in the pan of soap water when I heard someone come up on the front porch. Vivian was at the door. We stood there looking at each other a moment. Then she came in and took off her coat and galoshes. We went to sit at the fire in my room. I told her the only thing I could offer her was a cup of coffee. We went into the kitchen and warmed the coffee and returned to my room to sit before the fire. After I heard about it, I knew I had to see you, she said. I was coming to you tonight. I didn't know that. I'm glad you came. We finished our coffee, and I took the empty cups to the kitchen and washed them. When I came back to the room, I asked Vivian to lie on the bed beside me. We lay on our sides for a while. Then we lay on our backs, looking up at the ceiling. The room's only light came from the fireplace. When are you going back? Vivian asked me. I don't know, I said. I'll have to talk to Miss Emma. Have you seen her? She's in bed. Vivian was quiet a moment. Is that her house up there where the cars are? Yes. I wanted to stop in, but I didn't know if I should. You can go by before you leave. You think I ought to? She asked. I want you to, I said. You think this is a good time? I think so. I don't want to cause any trouble. You won't. I want them to like me, she said. They will. They'll have to. I don't want it that way. I'm going to live my life, Vivian, and I hope you're part of it. If they like it, it's all right. If they don't, it's the same. Vivian was quiet. We were holding hands, lying very close together with all our clothes on. After 15 or 20 minutes, we got up and got our coats. Vivian put on her galoshes. Her car was parked behind mine in front of the house. I said that we could come back and get her car later. I told her to walk in my track so her galoshes would not get muddy. We could hear the people inside the house as we came onto the porch. There were more people at the house now, and we had to push our way through to reach the bed. I brought someone to see you, Miss Emma, I said. Vivian moved closer to the bed, and Miss Emma's face showed that she remembered her. Vivian leaned over and whispered something to Miss Emma, and as she stood back, Miss Emma's eyes followed her. I could see in her eyes that she was pleased with what Vivian had said. I introduced Vivian to the others in the room. Then we went into the kitchen. Taunt Lou was at the stove, pouring hot water over the coffee grounds while talking to Mrs. Sarah James. Mrs. Sarah greeted me, and my aunt turned around and saw Vivian standing there. Miss Louise, Vivian said. Miss, Taunt Lou said, very polite. She really knew how to be polite to people when she felt they were interfering with something that belonged to her. She would not look at me. Irene Cole came into the kitchen, and she gave Vivian the same look, polite but cold. I introduced Vivian to her. Vivian nodded and smiled. Irene nodded but did not smile. I can get you a cup of coffee, she asked Vivian. Yes, thank you, Vivian said. I knew Vivian didn't want the coffee, but it would have seemed impolite to refuse it. With her cup of coffee, Vivian and I went into the front room again. Inez told me that Miss Emma wanted to speak to me before I left. I went back to the bed. Miss Emma nodded for me to sit down. The people who stood near the bed moved away so that Miss Emma and I could speak in privacy. Miss Emma looked up at me, and I was hoping that she would not start crying again. I felt very uncomfortable just sitting there. I don't know when I can go back up there, she said. She was speaking slowly and just above a whisper. She was not trying to keep others from hearing her. She had cried so much that she could not speak any louder. It's in your hands, she said. You and Reverend Moses. I just hope, I just hope, I just hope y'all work together. 
I looked away from her for a moment, but when I faced her again, I saw those eyes had not changed. I told her that I would try, and I stood up and looked around for Vivian. She was standing with one of my students by the door to the kitchen. Vivian was nodding and smiling. That's your girlfriend, Mr. Wiggins? The boy asked when I came over. Yes, I said. You're not trying to steal her, are you? Sir? The boy seemed surprised. No, sir. She's too old for me. Vivian laughed. You're about ready? I asked her. She took her empty coffee cup into the kitchen, and when she returned to the front room, she went to the bed to let Miss Emma know she was leaving. I saw Miss Emma watching her as she came back to me. I need a stiff drink, I said, when we were outside. You don't have anything in your car, do you? Nothing, Vivian said. What time is it? I asked. 7.30, quarter to 8, Vivian said without looking at her little wrist watch. It's still early. I'll follow you back to town. There's nothing closer? Not unless I went to that back room at the corner store. You know, I can't do that. It was dark after leaving the yard, and we walked single file and close to the ditch until we reached the cars. I opened the door, and Vivian got inside and rolled down the window. I'll see you at the rainbow, I said, and kissed her. I showed her a good place to turn around. Then I got into my car and followed her red lights out of the quarter. Twenty minutes later, we were sitting at a table at the Rainbow Club in Bayoni. I asked for a brandy set up, and Shirley brought us a half pint of Christian Brothers, a small pitcher of water, a bowl of ice, and four glasses. We drank the brandy straight up from two glasses, then we followed it with ice water from the other glasses. I think Irene is in love with you, Vivian said suddenly, as though she had been holding this in for a while. Just as my aunt is, I said. The other way, Vivian said. I can name about a dozen younger than Irene and about that many old as my aunt who are in love with me, I said. But I love only one woman. Don't you think she loves you? Vivian asked seriously. Sure, I said. I mean it, she said. I'm not playing. I mean it too, I said. I had taken a good shot of the brandy and I was beginning to feel much better. Irene loves me. My aunt loves me. The rest of them love me too and don't want an outsider taking me away from them. They want me for their own. Isn't that how it is everywhere? I don't know anything about everywhere, Vivian said. Of course you do, I said. It's the same old story. People want to keep a local boy for themselves because they have so little. I'm not talking about the people, Vivian said. I'm talking about Irene with those big brown cow eyes. Big brown cow eyes, I said. You know what I'm talking about, Vivian said. Don't tell me you're jealous of that child. Well, well what? Is she in love with you? Well, I'll be darned, I said. I had taken another shot of the brandy. Well, you still don't understand, do you? I understand young gals very well, Vivian said. Do you? I understand young gals and old ladies, too, I said. And by the way, what did you say to Miss Emma to make her look at you the way she did? I told her I was praying for both of them, Vivian said. That's the best thing you could have said. Go back to Irene, Vivian said. She's the one we're talking about. Irene and my aunt want from me what Miss Emma wants from Jefferson, I said. I don't know if Miss Emma ever had anybody in her past that she could be proud of. Possibly, maybe not. But she wants that now, and she wants it from him. Irene and my aunt want it from me. Miss Emma knows that the state of Louisiana is about to take his life. But before that happens, she wants something to remember him by. Irene and my aunt both know that one day I'll leave them, but they are not about to let me go without a fight. It's the same thing, the very same thing. Miss Emma needs a memory. Do you know what she told me when I sat on the bed? That Reverend Ambrose and I should get along, and together, together, we should try to reach Jefferson. Why not only Reverend Ambrose? 
Why not only the soul? No. She wants memories, memories of him standing like a man. Oh, she will meet him soon, and she knows that. But she wants memories, if only for a day, an hour, here on earth. Do you understand? No, Vivian said. She wasn't drinking anymore. Let me explain it to you. Let me see if I can explain it to you, I said. The brandy was really working well now. We black men have failed to protect our women since the time of slavery. We stay here in the South and are broken, or we run away and leave them alone to look after the children and themselves. So each time a male child is born, they hope he will be the one to change this vicious circle, which he never does, because even though he wants to change it, and maybe even tries to change it, it is too heavy a burden because all the others who have run away and left their burdens behind. So he too must run away as if he too is to hold on to his sanity and have a life of his own. I can see by your face you don't agree. So I'll try again. What she wants is for him, Jefferson, and me to change everything that has been going on for 300 years. She wants it to happen so in case she ever gets out of her bed again, she can go to that little church there in the quarter and say proudly, You see, I told you, I told you he was a man. And if she dies an hour after that, all right. But what she wants to hear first is that he did not crawl to that white man, that he stood at that last moment and walked. Because if he does not, she knows that she will never get another chance to see a black man stand for her. And for my aunt and Irene, it is the same. Who else does my aunt have? She has never been married. She raised my mother because my mother's mother, who was her sister, gave my mother to her when she was only a baby to follow a man whom the South had run away. Just as my own mother and my own father left me with her for greener pastures. And for Irene and for others there in the quarter, it's the same. They look at their fathers, their grandfathers, their uncles, their brothers, all broken. They see me and I, who grew up in that same plantation, can teach reading, writing, and arithmetic. I can give them something they, that neither a husband or father nor a grandfather ever did. So they want to hold on as long as they can. Not realizing that their holding on will break me too. That in order for me to be what they think I am, they want me to be, I must run as the others have done in the past. I drank. Now, do you see? Do you see? Will that circle ever be broken? I drank some ice water to chase down the brandy. It's up to Jefferson, my love. Chapter 22 When I came into the office, Paul looked me straight in the face. He knew it was unnecessary to search me in the food, but he knew he had to do it. He also knew that he should not even think about not doing it. It was as much his duty as wearing the uniform and carrying the cell keys. But you could see in his eyes that he was wondering why. Even when he was searching me and not looking in my face, I could tell by the light touches on my pockets that he didn't want to do it. And with the food, it was the same. The chief deputy sat behind the desk watching everything. To him, this was how things were supposed to be and how they would be. Paul and I left the office and walked down the narrow, dark corridor. Where would you like to meet him? he asked. In his cell? I don't mind. You want me close by? No, I don't think so. It can be different now, Paul said. It'll be okay, I said. How is he? He's taking it pretty good. Any changes? I haven't noticed any. We came up to the steel door to the cell block. You sure you want to be alone? Paul asked again. You're the first visitor since that news. I'm sure I'll be all right. If you say so. He opened the steel door for the first time. The prisoners did not call to me or stick their hands through the bars as I passed. Some spoke quietly. Others only nodded. But all were watching. Paul and I continued down the block to the last cell. Jefferson was lying on his back, staring up at the ceiling. Paul looked at me again. I nodded to him to indicate that I was not afraid and that I wanted to be alone with Jefferson. 
The deputy opened the cell door and let me in. Then he locked it and left. How are you, Jefferson? I'm all right. I brought you some food, I said. He, his body took up the bunk, so I set the bag of food on the floor near his head. I went to the wall and stood under the window. You need anything, Jefferson? He shook his head. You want to talk about anything? He shook his head again. Then he just lay there staring up at the ceiling while I stood watching him. What day is it? He asked without looking at me. It's Friday, Jefferson, I said. Friday, he said to himself. Friday. He was quiet for a moment. Then he slowly let his feet slide to the floor as he sat up on the bunk. Look like it's pretty out there, he said, gazing up at the window. Yes, it's a nice day, I said. No clouds anywhere, just blue. You think it's going to be like that that day, he asked. I didn't answer him. He was looking out the window when he said it. Now he turned to me. I hope it's the kind of day you want, Jefferson, I said. The kind of day I want, he said. The kind of day I want. I never got nothing I wanted in my whole life. Now I'm going to get a whole day? I didn't know what to say. He looked at me a while, then he turned to the window again. Do you like fruit, Jefferson? I asked him. I can pick up some fruit and some pecans, ice cream, funny books, things like that. I want me a whole gallon of ice cream, he said, still looking out the window. I saw a slight smile come on his face, and it was not a bitter smile. Not a bitter at all. A whole gallon of vanilla ice cream. Eat it with a pot spoon. My last supper. A whole gallon of ice cream. He looked at me again. Ain't never had enough ice cream. Never had more than a nickel cone. Used to run out in the quarter and hand the ice cream man my nickel, and he'd give me a little scoop on a comb. But now I go get me a whole gallon. That's what I want, a whole gallon. Eat it with a pot spoon. I can bring you some ice cream any time, Jefferson, I said. I'm going to wait, he said. I'm going to wait. I want a whole gallon. Eat it with a pot spoon. Every bit of it with a pot spoon. He smiled. He smiled now because he had something pleasant to look forward to, though it would be on that last day, and he would save it until the very last moment. You want to hear about the news from the quarter? I asked him. Stella had her baby. He looked at me, not as he had done in the past, in pain, with hate. He looked at me with an inner calmness now. Was it the ice cream? He favor Gable? He asked. With little babies, they don't favor anybody too much, I said. Oh, Gable, he said, and smiled to himself. Got himself a baby. Got himself a baby. Then I saw the face change. He was no longer smiling, but staring at the wall. We were supposed to go hunting that day. He had forgotten about the ice cream now. He was remembering the day he was supposed to go into the swamp with Gable, but instead had ended up with Brother and Bear at the liquor store. Inez is still giving up her fares up the quarter, I said, trying to get him back. But no music, no dancing. She calls that sinning. If you want your music at a fair, you have to go down to Willie Aaron's house. Willie still has that stack of old low-down blues. Tampa Red, Mercy D, you know, all of them. He was not listening to me now. He seemed to be thinking about hunting with Gable. I just thought of something, I told him. Let me bring you a little radio. You can have music all the time. You can listen to Randy Record Shop late at night. Randy still on? He asked, looking at the wall, not at me. Yes, he's still on, I said. I was listening to him just the other night. I have to play the radio low so Taunt Lou can't hear it. These old people, you know. All music except church music is sin and music. So I play it low. I can hardly hear it myself. I laughed to make him laugh, but he did not. Do you want me to bring you a little radio next time I come? I asked him. He nodded. Yeah. Edwin's has these little Philco's. Not too big, I said, and I boxed my hands to show him the approximate size of the radio. Would you like one of those? He nodded. I wish I had the money on me, I said. I'd go and get it right now. Don't bother, he said. 
He said it as though he didn't believe I really wanted to get it for him. I'll get it tomorrow, I said. I'll have them bring it to you so you'll have music over the weekend. He didn't have anything more to say. He sat there, not looking out the window, but now looking down at the floor, as if he had forgotten about the radio, about the ice cream, about Gable, about everything. I wanted to leave then to go home for the money to buy the radio, but I was afraid that the sheriff and his deputies might misinterpret my reason for leaving so early. I was sure they were not paying closer attention to everything now, and they would not have understood my reason for leaving earlier than I usually did. So I just stood there until the deputy came to let me out. Paul wanted to know how everything had gone between Jefferson and me, and I told him it was better than ever. He looked at me as if he felt I was making this all up, but I could see in his face that he wanted to believe it. I told him that I had promised Jefferson a radio and that I would go home and get the money to buy one. I would get it from Edwin's department store and leave it here for one of them to take to Jefferson so that he would have music over the weekend. Paul thought it was a good idea and he promised to give the radio to Jefferson himself. I didn't go home. I thought I would borrow the money from Vivian, and I went back to town to the Rainbow Club to wait until she got out of class. The bar was in semi-darkness as usual, with the usual two or three old men and talking more than drinking, and Claiborne behind the bar, talking with them. I ordered a beer and told Claiborne about the radio. He didn't charge me for the beer, and he went back down the bar and spoke to the old men. Then he came back with a couple of dollar bills and some change. He took five dollars out of an old leather wallet that had once been light brown, but had turned almost black over the years, that it had gone in and out of Claiborne's back pocket. Thanks, I said. I'll get it back to you sometime this weekend. The muscle in his left jaw moved a little to show that he had smiled. Then he jerked his head toward the wall a sign that I should go around to the other side and see what I could get in there. So after finishing the beer, I went through the side door into the cafe. It was much more brightly lit than the bar, warmer, and you could smell the food from the kitchen. A man and a woman ate at one of the tables. Another man sat eating alone at the counter, and Thelma was behind the counter near the cash register. Well, well, look what the cat dragged in, she said. I've been at the Rainbow quite a few times lately, but I had not eaten in the cafe. I told Thelma about the radio, and I told her that Claiborne had donated something. She listened, listened patiently, and I could see her face changing from patience to sadness to anger. Her mouth tightened as she looked around the room at her three customers, then back at me again. The anger had left. You hungry? she asked. It was stern, but loving, too. No, I ate before I came, I told her. She didn't believe me. I got some smothered steaks there, she said. Shrimps, chicken. I'm not hungry. You want to get that radio now? I would like to get it this afternoon. How much it cost? About $20. Eat something. I'll make up the rest, she said. She went back into the kitchen and dished up some rice and beef steak and sweet peas. And she added a little red lettuce and tomato salad and a couple of slices of light bread. How much more you need, she asked, after she had set the food down before me. About ten bucks, I said. But listen, Thelma, I can borrow some of that money from Vivian. Vivian got them children, she said. I can let you have it. I'll bring it back tomorrow. I ain't in no hurry. I ate the food hungrily because I had not had dinner, and I sopped up the gravy with the light bread. Thelma watched me all the time. When I was finished, she put a wrinkled $10 bill on the counter by my plate. Here. It was the kind of here your mother or big sister or your great aunt or your grandmother would have said. It was the kind of here that let you know this was hard-earned money, but also that you needed it more than she did. And the kind of here that said she wished you had it and didn't have to borrow it from her. But since you did not have it and she did, then here it was with a kind of love. It was the kind of here that asked the question, when will all this end? When will a man not have to struggle to have money to get what he needs here? 
When will a man be able to live without having to kill another man here? I took the money without looking at her. I didn't say thanks. I knew she didn't want to hear it. I went out to my car and drove back uptown. Edwin's was not the best store in town, but it was the place where most people bought what they needed. Those with money went either to Morgan's department store or to Baton Rouge and New Orleans. As you came into the store, you saw clothes for women on the left and clothes for men on the right, all set out neatly. There were no other customers and just one saleswoman who did not show much, much interest in me. I went to the back of the store, passing the furniture department with its chairs, couches, beds, shiffer robes, dressers, then the refrigerators and ice boxes, gas and wood burning stoves, washing machines. Then there was the garden and yard equipment, hoes, rakes, shovels, axe handles, mowing machines, yo yo blades, cane knives. And at the very end of the store were the radios and kitchen appliances on shelves against the wall. I saw the little radio that I had in mind, and I took it down from the shelf to look at more closely and feel its weight. Then I set it back on the shelf and turned on the knob, and after warming up for a few seconds, it started playing. I moved the lighted dial to get another station. I could find only three, two in Baton Rouge and one in New Orleans, but that was normal for this time of day. At night, you were able to tune in others. You could get one as far west as Del Rio, Texas, and another as far east as Nashville. I was still listening to one of the Baton Rouge stations when the saleswoman came up behind me. You gonna buy that? I looked around at the short, stout, powdered-faced white woman. Yes, ma'am. Her face changed, but only a little. How much is it? I asked. Twenty dollars plus tax. Do you have one in a box? That one's brand new, she said. Her face was getting hard again. It's a present, I said. I would like one in a box. I can put this one in a box, she said. No, ma'am, I want a brand new one, I said, if you have one. You can have this one for a dollar less, she said. I prefer a brand new one, please, ma'am, I said. She snapped the radio off and turned away. She was gone about 15 minutes. I knew it couldn't possibly take her that long to find another radio, but because I had refused to take the used one and because she felt quite sure there was no place in Bayoni where I could find another one, she knew I had little choice but to wait until she got back. Brand new one, she said behind me. Seal ain't even broke. Does it have batteries? I asked. It's ready to play, she said. You want it? Yes, ma'am, I said. She started up the aisle toward the cash register, but just then, another white woman came into the store. The clerk set the radio beside the cash register and went to see what the white woman wanted. The other woman was not buying anything. She only wanted to talk. So they stood there about ten minutes before the clerk came back to wait on me. After ringing up the bill, she asked me if I needed a bag, but she asked it in a way that I knew she didn't want to give me one. No thanks, I told her, and after paying, I tucked the little radio under my arm and left. The courthouse was to the right and across the street from the store. I walked between the parked cars and past the statue of the Confederate soldier and the state, national and Confederate flags. Paul and Sheriff Gidry were in the front office. Paul saw the package under my arm, and I could see that he was happy that I had remembered. The sheriff looked up at me from his desk. Well, I prefer, sir, is that the radio? Yes, sir, I hope you don't mind. No, I don't mind this time, he said. But from now on, you ask permission before you bring anything else in here. I spoke to the deputy. The deputy can't give you permission to bring things in here. I do, he said. I was quiet. Leave it, the sheriff said. I'll see he gets it. Batteries, I hope. Yes, sir, batteries, I said. I had almost said batteries. How did it go today, I asked. All right, I said. The sheriff nodded. I'll see he gets it. Thank you, sir. I looked at Paul. He nodded and smiled. He probably would have said something encouraging if the sheriff had not been there. 
I went to my car and drove back to the Rainbow, hoping that Vivian would be there and that we would have a drink and just sit there in the semi-darkness, alone, together. Chapter 23 Miss Emma felt well enough on Monday to accompany my aunt and Reverend Ambrose to visit Jefferson. After the usual search, Paul led them down to the day room, then went to the cell for Jefferson. Jefferson asked if he could take the radio. The deputy said no. Jefferson said he wouldn't go. I would hear later that Jefferson had not turned the radio off since Paul brought it to him on Friday evening. The other prisoners could hear the radio at all times of the day and night. No one else had a radio, and the prisoners wished he would play it louder, but no one would dare say anything to him. The prisoners nearest his cell could faintly hear the music he played, but the ones further away could only hear static, though he searched day and night for stronger stations. "'You want me to bring them here?' Paul asked Jefferson. Jefferson went on listening to the radio without answering him. The deputy returned to the day room and told Miss Emma what had happened. She had already set the table, and she and my aunt and Reverend Ambrose had taken their places, leaving a space for Jefferson. The food, beef stew and Irish potatoes, were still in the pot and covered. A tablespoon and a paper napkin lay beside each tin pan on a white tablecloth. Radio? Miss Emma asked Paul. Grant bought him one. When? Last Friday. That mean he ain't coming? That's what he said, the deputy told her. Miss Emma sat staring at the space where Jefferson was supposed to eat. Then she looked up at Paul again. Can we go to him? she asked. Sure, he said, but it's going to be uncomfortable. Y'all trying to eat out of them pans standing up? We don't mind, Miss Emma said, and pushed herself up from the table. My aunt helped her collect everything. Then the three of them followed the deputy back to the cell. Jefferson lay on his bunk, listening to music on the radio. Forty-five minutes later, when Paul returned to the cell, he found the radio turned off and Jefferson lying on his side, facing the wall, his back to the people. The deputy opened the door to let them out and Jefferson turned from the wall and snapped on the radio. Paul told Miss Emma that the sheriff wanted to see her. The sheriff was sitting behind his desk. There were two empty chairs, but he did not ask anyone to sit down. He give you any trouble back there? The sheriff asked Miss Emma. No, sir. I said from the start I didn't want any trouble, the sheriff said. If that radio is causing any trouble, I'll get it out of there. It ain't causing no trouble, Miss Emma said. He didn't come to the day room. We went to him. We managed. Standing up? Yes, sir, we didn't mind. You minded before, the sheriff said. That's why you went and worried my wife. Yes, sir, Miss Emma said. Listen, the sheriff said, pointing a finger across the desk. He hasn't got much time. I don't want any trouble. You'll have to work together with that teacher. We go and work together, Miss Emma said. I'll talk to Grant when I get back. What about you, Reverend? The sheriff asked. My duty to stand by Sis Emma, Reverend Ambrose said. What about Jefferson? The sheriff asked. What about his soul? According to Paul, who told me this later, Reverend Ambrose lowered his eyes and did not answer. All right, the sheriff said, y'all work it out your way. Any problems, and I'll take that radio or stop the visits. Reverend Ambrose came back to the quarter between 2.30 and 3 o'clock. And when I dismissed school, one of the boys came back to tell me that my aunt wanted to see me at Miss Emma's house before I went home. All three of them were sitting around the kitchen table when I came in. They had already finished their coffee. The cups were still on the table, but empty. You know what you done done, my aunt asked me. I could tell by her face and her voice that she was mad. What did I do, I asked. Why? Why what, Taunt Lou? That radio, she said, that radio. What's wrong with the radio? What's wrong with it, Reverend Ambrose cut in. What's wrong with it? That's all we do, listen to that radio. That's what's wrong with it. And what's wrong with that, I asked. He didn't have time to come sit down with us today. That's what's wrong with that, the minister said. He ain't got time for nothing else. 
That's what's wrong with that. Jefferson needs something in that cell, I said. Yes, he do, the minister said. You hit the nail on the head, mister. Yes, he do, but not that box. What do you suggest, Reverend Ambrose? I asked. God, the minister said. He ain't got but five more Fridays and a half. He needs God in that cell and not that sin box. What sin box, I said. What you call that kind of music he listened to? The minister asked. I standing in there trying to talk to him and him listening to that thing till she got to reach over and turn it off. What you call it? I call it company, Reverend Ambrose, I said. And I call it sin company, he said. I don't care what you call it, I said to him. Grant, my aunt said. I could see that she was becoming more and more angry with me. Now she got up from her chair. You don't talk like that, she said. Never. Louise, Miss Emma called to her. Louise, I didn't raise you that way, my aunt said, coming toward me. Louise, please, Lord, don't. Miss Emma pushed up from her chair. My aunt stopped a step or two away from me, though it was clear she wanted to slap me. We have to get something straight around here, I said. All right, now, I don't know a thing about God or sin. What I do know is, my Lord, the minister said, looking at me as if I were the devil himself. Listen to the teacher of our children. Last Friday, I continued, was the first time, the very first time, that Jefferson looked at me without hate, without accusing me of putting him in that cell. Last Friday was the first time he ever asked me a question or answered me without accusing me for his condition. I don't know if y'all know what I'm talking about. It seems you don't. But I found a way to reach him for the first time. Now, he needs that radio and he wants it. He wants something of his own before he dies. He wants a gallon of ice cream for his last supper. Did he tell you that? Did he tell you he never had enough ice cream? Did he tell you that he never had a radio of his own before? Did he tell you any of this? He wants those things before he dies. He has only a month to live, and all I'm trying to do is make it as comfortable as I can for him. And after that radio and that ice cream, how about his soul, mister? My aunt asked me. I don't know a thing about the soul, I said. Yes, you do, she said. She tightened her mouth. She wanted to cry, and she wanted to slap me, not only for this moment, but for all those years that I had refused to go to her church. Yes, you do, she said, shaking her head, because I raised you better. And you sent him, me to him, Taunt Lou, I said. I'm only trying to teach him the best way I can, turning him against God. Taunt Lou, that radio has nothing to do with turning Jefferson against God, I said. That radio is there to help him not think about death. He's locked up in that cage like an animal. And what else can he think about but that last day and that last hour? The radio makes it less painful. Now, if you all want that radio out of there, you just go on and take it from him. But I won't go back up there anymore. We got to have it. Your way or else, that's it, Reverend Ambrose cut in. No, I said, you can have it your way. You can take it from him, but you won't reach him if you do. The only thing that keeps him from thinking he's not a hog is that radio. Take that radio away and let's see what you can do for the soul of a hog. Then I'm the one that's not needed, the minister said. No, Miss Emma said, you have to go, Reverend Ambrose. I'll make him see. You saw today how it was, the minister said. He can't hear me through that wall of sin. I'll make him see, Miss Emma said. He needs you. Maybe he don't know it yet, but he needs you. Maybe you don't know it yet either, Grant. All I know, Miss Emma, is that last Friday was the first time I reached him, I said. It was the first time he didn't call himself a hog. And that whole gallon of ice cream, the minister said. You sure you reached him? I didn't know how to answer that. Well, Mr. Teacher, Reverend Ambrose said, I'm waiting for your answer. My aunt and Miss Emma were also waiting. 
I went back to see Jefferson again on Wednesday. On Tuesday, I had asked the children at the school to bring large pecans and roasted peanuts for me to take to him. Some brought pecans in paper bags, some brought them in little flour and rice sacks, others brought them in their pockets. There were about 25 pounds of pecans, about half that many pounds of roasted peanuts. I took a few pounds of each and left the rest to be distributed among the children after school. In Biani, I bought a half dozen apples, some candy, and two or three comic books. You did not hear the music until you got near the cell. He was lying on his bunk, the little radio on the floor at his head. Paul let me in and left. How's it going, partner? I said. The children sent you some pecans and peanuts. I bought you some apples and a couple candy bars, some funny books. He let his feet slide to the floor as he sat up on the bunk. I stood there a while. Then I sat down at the foot of the bunk and handed him the bag. He took it without saying anything and set it on the floor. The radio was still playing. Doing all right? I asked him. He sat there staring at the wall in front of him. His big hands clasped together. He nodded his head. How's the radio? I asked him. All right. Did you get Randy over the weekend? Yeah, I caught him. I listened to him a little bit myself, I said. You didn't have any trouble getting the station, did you? No, I got him all right, he said. We were quiet. He stared at the concrete wall. The radio was playing western music on a station out of Baton Rouge. You want to ask me anything? He shook his head. I waited a moment until I thought it was a good time to speak. I saw your nan nan the other day after she came back from seeing you, Jefferson. She said you didn't have dinner with them in the day room. They had to come here and they couldn't sit down. He didn't say anything. When they come back, can you meet them in there, Jefferson? She needs that. All right. You'll do it for me, for her, I asked. All right. She would love that, Jefferson. And Reverend Ambrose, will you let him talk to you? All right. I didn't know anything else to talk about, and he had nothing to say, so we just sat there quietly a while. Jefferson, I said finally, I want to be your friend. I want you to ask me questions. I want you to say anything that comes to your mind, anything you want to say to me. I don't care what it is. Say it. I'll keep it to myself if you want. I'll talk about it to other people if you want. What do you, will you do that for me? He nodded his head. He was staring at the wall. I just thought of something, I said. Something at night. Something when you're thinking about something and may not be able to remember it when I come back. I was just thinking maybe I could bring you a little notebook and a pencil. You could write your thoughts down and we could talk about it when I come back. Or maybe you could talk to Reverend Ambrose about it when he came to visit you. Would you like that? All right. You want me to bring it? If you want. And you would write down your thoughts? Anything you want to talk about? He nodded his head, but he was still looking at the wall. Do you believe I'm your friend, Jefferson? I asked him. Do you believe I care about you? He didn't answer. Jefferson? But he was not listening. I looked around the cell at the seatless brown stained commode, the wash bowl whose faucets never stopped dripping the little metal shelf over the bowl which held his pan, tin cup, and spoon. Through the barred window I could see the branches of the sycamore tree stirring from a soft breeze. There was still a chill in the air, and Jefferson wore one of my heavy wool shirts. On the floor the little radio had been playing one western song after another. You like that country stuff, huh? It don't matter. Me, I go for Randy, I said. I like those low-down blues. I heard someone opening the big steel door at the other end of the cell block, and as he came down the aisle, I could hear Paul speaking to the prisoners. Well, I guess I'll be taking off, I said. Anything you want me to tell your nan nan? I had stood. Now he looked up at me. There was no hate in his face, but, Lord, there was pain. I could see that he wanted to say something, but it was hard for him to do. I stood over him, waiting. Tell... Tell the children, thank you for the pe pecans, he stammered. I caught myself grinning like a fool. I wanted to throw my arms around him and hug him. 
I wanted to hug the first person I came to. I felt like someone who had just found religion. I felt like crying with joy. I really did. I held out my hand. He raised his, a big hand, but with no grip. Cool, dead weight. I squeezed his hand with both of mine. I must have had that grin still on my face when Paul opened the door to let me out. Everything's okay, he, he asked. Yes, I said. Chapter 24 Miss Emma thought we should all visit Jefferson together as often as we could. I wasn't crazy about the idea of being at the courthouse at the same time as the minister, but one look for my aunt and I decided that I would go along at least once. Leaving Irene Cole and Odessa Freeman in charge of classes, I drove to Bayani with a bag of pecans and peanuts. I remembered my promise to Jefferson, so I dropped by the drugstore for a notebook and a pencil. It was a little after two when I got to the courthouse. The minister, Miss Emma, and my aunt were waiting for me outside. They stood by the minister's car, near the statue of the Confederate soldier and the three flags. The flags hung, hung limp beneath the overcast sky. The minister and my aunt looked at me, and both seemed angry, as if I had kept them waiting deliberately. I had not, of course. If I had not stopped for the notebook and pencil, I probably would have arrived there before they did. But I did not explain this to them. Miss Emma did not feel the same way as they did, and that was all that mattered. Both she and my aunt carried food baskets covered with dish towels. As I approached them, Miss Emma pushed herself away from the car and started heavily toward the entrance to the courthouse. My aunt and the minister walked behind her, and I followed. Paul was not there, and the chief deputy, after searching the food and us, led us out of the office into the corridor. He walked several paces ahead of us, as if we were not with him. When we came to the restroom marked white men, he went inside. We waited for him along the wall. Five minutes later, he came out with another white man. They stood there talking another minute or two before he continued along the corridor. He went up the steps and into the day room, and without a word, he opened the door and left us. Miss Emma and my aunt spread out a tablecloth on the table. Then they placed a pan, a spoon, and a paper napkin in five places. After they had set up everything, they and the minister sat down, but I remained standing. The first thing you heard were the chains around his ankles. Then Jefferson entered the room through the rear door, followed by the deputy. Jefferson wore the same brown wool shirt he'd had on a couple of days before. He had on a pair of faded denims and brogans with no laces. He was dragging his feet to keep the shoes on. Here he is, the deputy said. See y'all at three. Paul's not here today? I asked. Mr. Paul's got other duties, the deputy said. He looked at me as if to remind me that I was supposed to say Mr. before a white man's name. He stood there eyeing me until he felt that I understood. I brought you some good old gumbo, Miss Emma said to Jefferson. How's it going, partner? I said as I took my seat beside him. All right, he said. The radio's still playing? He nodded his head. Good, I said. Miss Emma put rice in each pan, then she poured the gumbo over the rice until the pan was nearly full. Besides shrimps, she had put smoked sausage and chicken in the gumbo, and she had seasoned it well with green onions, filet, and black pepper. Gumbo was something you could always eat, even if you were not hungry. I started in, but I was the only one and I soon realized why. May we bow our heads, the minister said, after I put down my spoon. Jefferson's head had been bowed from the moment he sat down. I lowered my eyes. Our Father who art in heaven, Reverend Ambrose began. He went through the Lord's Prayer, but that was only for warming up. Then he really got down to praying. He asked God to come down to Bayani, into the courthouse, into the jail, walk along the cell block, go into each cell and touch each heart, come into this room and touch the hearts of those here who did not know him in the pardon of their sins. As he prayed, the minister would slump closer and closer to the table. 
Then he would jerk his head up and gaze at the ceiling. Miss Emma and my aunt responded with, Amen, amen, amen. But Jefferson was quiet and so was I. Whether or not he was listening, I don't know. But all I was thinking about was the gumbo getting cold. Finally, Reverend Ambrose brought his prayer sermon to an end, begging God to bless the gift on the table, which was there to nourish our bodies, so that we might do his bidding. Everyone responded with amen, except Jefferson. I started eating. The gumbo was warm, but not hot. Ain't you going to eat, Jefferson? Miss Emma said. Ain't hungry. Miss Emma was not eating either, but the minister and my aunt and I were. I broke off a piece of bread from one of the loaves that Miss Emma had baked. I didn't look at her. I didn't want to see her face. The children sent you some more pecans and peanuts, I said to Jefferson. Did you eat the others I brought you? Some, he said. The peanuts, too? Few, he said, his head down. I brought you that notebook and that pencil, I said. Do you remember what we talked about? He nodded shortly. Have you been thinking of questions to ask me? He nodded again. Do you want to ask me now? He didn't say anything. I finished my pan of gumbo. There's more there, Grant, Miss Emma said. No, ma'am, that was good, I said, glancing at her. I didn't want to look at her too long. I knew what I would find in her face, and I didn't want to see it. You want to walk? I said to Jefferson. He moved on the bench without answering. You could hear the chains around his ankles as he swung his legs over the bench. Then he braced his cuffed hands against the table to push himself up. We started walking around the room. Miss Emma watched us. My aunt and the minister went on eating, but they did not seem to be enjoying their food. Jefferson, I want us to be friends, I said. Not only you and me, but I want you to be friends with your Nanan. I want you to be more than a godsend to her. A godson obeys, but a friend. Well, a friend would do anything to please a friend. We were passing by the table, so I lowered my voice. Jefferson shuffled along beside me, his cuffed hands hanging below his waist, his shoulders too close together, his head down. A friend does a lot of little things, I went on. It would mean so much to her if you would eat some of the gumbo. I stopped when we came to the corner of the room. He stopped, too, his head still down. Look at me, Jefferson, please, I said. He raised his head slowly. I smiled at him. Will you be her friend? Will you eat some of the gumbo? Just a little bite? One spoonful? He made a slight nod. I smiled at him again. Jefferson, I said. We had started walking. Do you know what a hero is, Jefferson? A hero is someone who does something for other people. He does something that other men do, don't and can't do. He is different from other men. He is above other men. No matter who those other men are, the hero, no matter who he is, is above them. I lowered my voice again until we had passed the table. I could never be a hero. I teach, but I don't like teaching. I teach because it is the only thing that an educated black man can do in the South today. I don't like it. I hate it. I don't even like living here. I want to run away. I want to live for myself and for my woman and for nobody else. That is not a hero. A hero does for others. He would do anything for people he loves because he knows it would make their lives better. I am not that kind of person but I want you to be. You could give something to her, to me, to those children in the quarter. You could give them something that I never could. They expect it from me, but not from you. The white people out there are saying that you don't have it, that you're a hog, not a man. But I know they are wrong. You have the potentials. We all have, no matter who we are. Those out there are no better than we are, Jefferson. They are worse. That's why they are always looking for a scapegoat, someone else to blame. I want you to show them the difference between what they think you are and what you can be. To them, you're nothing but another blank. No dignity, no heart, no love for your people. You can prove them wrong. You can do more than I ever can. 
I have always done what they wanted me to do. Teach reading, writing, and arithmetic. Nothing else. Nothing about dignity. Nothing about identity. Nothing about loving and caring. They never thought we were capable of learning these things. Teach those blank how to print their names and how to figure on their fingers. And I went along, but hating myself all the time for doing so. We were coming up to the table again, and the ones at the table were quiet and trying to hear what we were saying. I did not start talking again until we had passed them. Do you know what a myth is, Jefferson? I asked him. A myth is an old lie that people believe in. White people believe that they're better than anyone else on earth, and that's a myth. The last thing they ever want to see is a black man stand and think, and show that common humanity that is in us all. It would destroy their myth. They would no longer have justification for having made us slaves and keeping us in the condition we are in. As long as none of us stand, they're safe. They're safe with me. They're safe with Reverend Ambrose. They don't want them to feel safe with you anymore. I want you to chip away at that myth by standing. I want you, yes you, to call them liars. I want you to show them that you are as much a man, more a man than they can ever be. That jury, you call them men? That judge, is he a man? The governor is no better. They play by the rules their forefathers created hundreds of years ago. Their forefathers said that we're only three-fifths human, and they believe it to this day. Sheriff Gidry does too. He calls me professor, but he doesn't mean it. He calls Reverend Ambrose reverend, but he doesn't respect him. When I showed him the notebook and pencil I brought you, he grinned. Do you know why? He believes it was just a waste of time and money. What can a hog do with a pencil and paper? We stopped. His head was down. Look at me, Jefferson, please, I said. He raised his head. He had been crying. He raised his cuffed hands and wiped one eye, then the other. I need you, I told him. I need you much more than you could ever need me. I need to know what to do with my life. I want to run away, but go where and do what? I'm needed here and I know it, but I feel that all I'm doing here is choking myself. I need someone to tell me what to do. I need you to tell me, to show me. I'm no hero. I can just give something small. That's all I have to author, offer. It's the only way that we can chip away at that myth. You, you can be bigger than anyone you have ever met. Please listen to me, because I would not lie to you now. I speak from my heart. You have the chance of being bigger than anyone who has ever lived on that plantation or come from this little town. You can do it if you try. You have seen how Mr. Farrell makes a slingshot handle. He starts with just a little piece of rough wood, any little piece of scrap wood. Then he starts cutting, cutting and cutting and cutting, then shaving. Shaves it down clean and smooth till it's not what it was before, but something new and pretty. You know what I'm talking about because you've seen him do it. You had one that he made from a piece of scrap wood. Yes, yes, I saw you with it, and it came from a piece of old wood that he found in the yard somewhere, and that's all we are, Jefferson, all of us on this earth, a piece of drifting wood, until we, each one of us, individually, decide to become something else. I am still that piece of drifting wood, and those out there are no better, but you can be better because we need you to be and want you to be. Me? your godmother, the children, and all the rest of them in the quarter. Do you understand what I'm saying to you, Jefferson? Do you? He looked at me in great pain. He may not have understood, but something was touched, something deep down in him, because he was still crying. I cry not for reaching any conclusion by reasoning, but because, lowly as I am, I am still part of the whole. Is that what he was thinking as he looked at me crying? Come on, I said, let's have some gumbo. And we went back to the table.